begin by thanking Professors Yellen and Cunningham for inviting me to participate in this meeting. My name is Mansur Hussain, and I'm Professor of Medicine at the University of Toronto and an attending cardiologist at the Toronto General Hospital. I've been asked to talk about GLP-1 analogs and whether we've reached the limits in cardiovascular medicine. The answer to that is most certainly no, and the three take-home messages are I believe these agents remain underutilized in patients who could benefit from them. I believe there are potential additive benefits using them together with SGLT2 inhibitors. And there are new GLP-1 analogs that have GIP analog function, which may be even more potent cardiovascular medications. Here are my disclosures. Let's begin with some epidemiology. This is a plot that looks at the event rate per 100,000 adult patients in the United States between 1990 and 2010. You'll appreciate that there's been a slight fall in the incidence of acute myocardial infarction, whereas that of stroke, amputation, and end-stage renal disease have remained flat in the general adult population. In patients with type 2 diabetes, the event rates have been falling of MI, stroke, and to a lesser extent, amputation and end-stage renal disease. And on the surface, this may look like good news, but at the top you'll appreciate that the number of patients who have self-identified with diabetes has tripled from 6.5 million in 1990 to almost 21 million in 2010. You'll also appreciate that the incidence rate is many, many fold higher than that in the adult population. As such, there remains a significant cardiovascular disease and risk burden in patients with type 2 diabetes. And how do we begin to address that? Well, in this analysis by Ray and colleagues published over a decade ago in The Lancet, where they looked at the benefits of re treating risk factors in patients with type 2 diabetes, we learned that reducing systolic blood pressure and reducing LDL cholesterol had significant impacts. In that era, treating hemoglobin A1c, in other words, better, tighter glycemic control, did not translate into significant improvements. But this was the era of traditional glucose-lowering medications. Metformin, sulfonylureas, insulin, PPAR gamma agonists, and just emerging at that time, DPP-4 inhibitors. We didn't have what we have now two classes of drugs, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists, that have significant cardiovascular benefits. As Darren McGuire summarizes in this meta-analysis, the reduction of MACE, that is CV death, non-fatal MI, and stroke in patients with type 2 diabetes at high risk of cardiovascular disease is significant in those randomized to receive an SGLT2 inhibitor. A 10% reduction in these 47,000 patients so randomized. When we look at CV death and heart failure for hosp hospitalization for heart failure, they're even more impressive, 15% reduction and 32% reduction, respectively. Now let's look at the cardiovascular outcome trials of GLP-1 receptor agonists. There have been seven trials that show with the three, same three-point MACE a 13% reduction in 56,000 patients. If I look at CV death, there's a 12% reduction. And if I look at hospitalization for heart failure, there's a very reassuring 9% reduction. And then, if we look at only those GLP-1 receptor agonists that are based on human GLP-1, not the lizard exenatide molecule, it's a 17% reduction in three-component mace, arguably more potent in these endpoints than SGLT2 inhibitors. Specifically, stroke is a very consistent result in these cardiovascular outcome trials, with an overall 16% reduction. I'll remind you that this is more potent than any other of the components I've already discussed. This has resulted, of course, in both in Europe and North America, and now globally, all of the guidelines identifying the benefits of these agents. In patients with type 2 diabetes, with established CVD or at high risk of CVD, we should be using an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 receptor agonists, even as first-line therapy. 
and then in patients who are not uh, at glycemic target or who are already on background metformin therapy, the same recommendation has been made, importantly, irrespective of A1C. So are we using these drugs? Well, in this Scottish registry of almost a quarter million patients, where the background demographics are very similar to those cardiovascular outcome trials, 32% of the patients had established CVD in this registry. And you'll appreciate here pretty high uses of antihypertensive medication and antilipid medications, appropriate treatment of important cardiovascular risk factors. But when it comes to the use of diabetes medications, less than 3% of those patients without CVD were on a GLP-1 or an SGLT-2 inhibitor. That might be acceptable, but what about those patients with CVD? Again, surprisingly, less than 3% of patients are on drugs with proven benefits in this population. What about combining SGLT2 inhibitors with GLP-1 receptor agonists? This is a retrospective analysis published in abstract form at the ADA, looking at about 12,500 patients propensity matched with patients taking sulfonuria. Those uh, on background GLP-1 receptor agonists were either taking SGLT2 inhibitors or sulfonuria. And you'll appreciate a 25 to 30 percent reduction in CV events and a 35 to 40 percent reduction in heart failure hospitalization, suggesting in this retrospective analysis that there's additional benefit of SGLT2 inhibitors even in patients already on GLP-1 receptor agonists. Let me end with these exciting data. There are now agents that are GLP-1 receptor agonists, but also GIP receptor agonists. Terzepatide is one such agent. As these plots show, dose response curves and cyclic AMP accumulation in cells are comparable to that of native GIP, somewhat less potent with regards to activating the GLP-1 receptor. But what about a head-to-head -head comparison of this agent versus GLP-1 receptor agonist semaglutide? The SURPASS-2 study looked at people inadequately controlled on background metformin and randomized them to three different doses of terzepatide once weekly versus semaglutide one milligram once weekly. You'll appreciate more potent A1C reduction, more potent weight loss, and a higher percentage of patients achieving, achieving glycemic target. To summarize, there are high rates of CVD that remain a major burden in patients with type 2 diabetes, and drugs proven to reduce this risk are not being used in these patients. GLP-1 receptor agonist cardiovascular outcome trials clearly identify benefit in patients with CVD or at high risk of CVD, and combining the two classes of drugs may be even better. One of the more consistent and robust effects of GLP-1 appears to be on stroke. We don't yet know if the remarkable metabolic effects of these dual agents or twinquitins will also have cardiovascular benefits. So in answer to the question, have the limits been reached? The answer is no. We have much further to go. Thank you very much.